Think. Act. <laughs> and prosper. You are now tuned into the Money Level Show. Hey, Justin, what is going on? What's been happening? Ooh, uh, it's summertime. Summer, the summer doldrums for uranium are, are, I think, getting close to their end. But we've got weeks and weeks behind us of just very, very slow trading. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been very quiet, with the the exception of a few pieces of news, which we can get into. But generally speaking. It's just been quiet time during the summer, which is pretty typical for uranium. Yeah. How are you doing, Daryl? Oh, I'm, I'm doing pretty well, pretty well. Uh, I, I saw we had uh, some some moves in, in the equities recently. Um, we had a uh, move in, I mean, at least the, the stocks that, that I'm in. I've seen, I've seen a recent move. It seems like things are still range bound. Um, you know, some people are wondering... You know whether they should have took taken profits. Uh, I've I've had some commenters uh, that were dissatisfied with some of their uranium holdings in terms of uh, the prices uh, going up and then coming back to where where they bought in at, then going up and then coming back to where they bought in at. And so this that's kind of like where I see like you know is there some technical trading opportunities here you know in terms of when you get these bounces and and such. And so uh, I've been learning a lot more technical trading and, and charts and such. And so um, what, what's your take on that? I mean, obviously, you're bullish for the long term. Um, it seems like many of these companies are trading within the range. And I haven't looked at the chart specifically, but just from looking at price action. And um, and we're waiting on a breakout and a confirmation um, uh, breakout or whatnot. So what, what, what are you seeing there? Yeah, it's been a decent pullback over the last week and a half or so after a nice little pop in the sector from the previous week when there was news out of Kazakhstan that they introduced a, a higher tax rate for uranium production in the country. And this news kind of got brushed under the rug and is pretty much all but forgotten about. And I think it's it's a pretty significant piece of news. So the, the, the tax rate prior to this new implementation was 6% basically across the board. What they did is they introduced a progressive tax. It's not a marginal tax. It's based on the size of each individual deposit in its production and potentially the price of uranium that is sold. So in, in the larger the project, the higher the tax rate. And it, like I said, it's not marginal. So if you've got a project that's above, let's say 3000 tons a year in production, which is about seven and a half million pounds, the, per year, that is, a, I believe, I don't have the chart right in front of me, but I think it was a 16% tax rate. It's a very, very large jump in taxation. And for Kazadam Prom themselves, because they're still majority state owned, the, the taxation rate from them is sort of just kind of like out of the right pocket into the left pocket uh, because it's going out of a state owned corporation into the pocket of, a, of, of the state itself. But for the joint venture partners, that price has to be essentially passed on to their consumers. So we're going to see higher pricing pressure coming out of Kazakhstan. It's not clear yet whether or not this higher taxation rate is going to influence less or slower development of the new deposits in Kazakhstan or disincentivizing production. But at the very least, I believe most likely it's going to do two things, which would be influence the higher pricing if the largest producer in the world on a 100% basis is going to have to raise its prices to accommodate for the lower profit margins because of this higher tax rate, that's going to affect the overall pricing in the market. And secondly, I think that it's also going to aid in the eventual acceptance of nuclear utilities of this pricing environment and or higher prices incoming. So those two things I think are a pretty big takeaway from, from that news. But as far as the charts go, there's some decent technical damage here. Uh, the, there's been a pullback 20 to 30 percent, which sounds like a lot, and it is. But we see at least two of this pull, this magnitude pullback every single year in the sector. So it's a it's a cyclical pullback of a secular trend, happens frequently, and especially during the summer months when the physical market is very quiet, it's not uncommon at all. 
I do think that the slow period is coming to an end. We have a few things coming up in the next six to eight weeks. That would be uh, Cameco's conference call for Q2, which is happening a week from, I believe, tomorrow or next Wednesday, if I recall correctly. The following day is an update from Kazakhstan with a trading update. And then uh, Kazadam Prom, excuse me. And then Kazadam Prom will have their conference call as well a couple of weeks after that. That is then on the heels uh, on the heels of that is the WNA Symposium in London in the first week of September, leading into a strong season, typical strong season for uranium equities and the physical market, new budgets for nuclear utilities, the NEI conference at the end of October, a lot of action happening Q3, Q4. So considering that we've been consolidating in price for uranium for about five months and the equities have been rising, falling, kind of chopping basically sideways action on balance for that period of time as well. I think we're setting up for a move here. It's possible that a weakening broad market could influence this quiet market to the downside if this if that happens between now and then. Hard to say exactly where the next move is going to go, but generally speaking, we're about to enter what is typically a strong season with the various catalysts I just mentioned. So uh, we think we think this consolidation period is coming to a close relatively soon, and we should see a decent move coming after that. Okay, okay. So um, <clears throat> you mentioned Kazadam Prom and the higher taxes, and you mentioned how that impacts um, investment into uh their uranium which ultimately goes back into increasing production and um and how costs have to be passed on likely passed on to consumers and so um in in that type of um is this is this uncommon for a uh company i mean obviously it being state owned you mentioned like it going into like the the left pocket to the right pocket of of the government <laughs> of the government i mean which is it's savvy, but that's government, right? I mean, and so um, is is this 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 isn't common for a um, for nuclear nuclear energy or uranium producing companies, right? I mean, is is Kazakhstan the only one that that this risk is is uh, there? I mean, I suppose you could always see different tax regimes being implemented based on uh, different political powers. Uh, coming and going that's that's always possible for that sort of thing but this is a big jump for the largest producer which is why it's so significant you know it's probably would be less significant it happened in the united states for example because there's barely any uranium production right now that should increase in the coming years but for the largest producer and it's not even close in terms of the second largest producer for the largest producer that's that's mining what 40 percent of the world's uh, uh, annual production to have their tax rate essentially, you know, two to three X is, is pretty significant. So um, it, it, they're still going to be making a lot of money, you know, the Kazan problem and their joint venture partners, because the production in the country is quite inexpensive, even, you know, the all in sustaining cost, let's say is probably in the thirties, but when you fully allocate and include the dividend, you're probably in the forties per pound. So still a very, very large profit margins, even with that higher tax rate, but they have to factor it in somehow. So either, they spend less and disincentivize rapid production increases because of the lower profit margins due to this tax, or they just pass it on to the utilities. So they come to the negotiations table for delivery in 2026. They're going to have to say, hey, you guys saw what, what they just imposed on us. So for Arano and Cameco and Uranium One, the Japanese, the Chinese, the joint venture partners, they're going to have to raise their prices um, a decent a decent amount in order to accommodate for the higher tax. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. And and how does this impact uh, term contracts? Does this like you know increase the the price per pound in terms of like uh, utilities having to come contract and they have to contract at higher prices? It's hard to say whether producers outside of Kazakhstan are going to utilize this as kind of an excuse to justify raising prices beyond the current price range for long-term contract negotiations, which is floors in the 70s and 80s and ceilings, you know, 120, 130 market referenced, um, perhaps with a mix of a little bit of base escalated, but that's where the market is right now. Um, but it will go in that direction. And the tax is rolled out. I believe it starts next year and then it and then it goes higher into 2026. So it's not immediate. So that'll take some time to kind of filter into the contract negotiations, but it certainly is not going to be an influence to the downside in terms of price. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. 
And so I think uh, I was interviewing, uh, I believe I was talking to Lobo Tigre, and um, we were talking about uranium, and I think he had mentioned you in terms of, like, uh, we were talking about the uh, potential second shoe to drop with uh, Kazakhstan's uh, production numbers for 2025. Uh, what, what's your what's your assessment outlook? Uh, what, what, are you, what are you thinking about in terms of that? Because they did come out in 2023 and said that um, – that they were going to not produce as much in 2024. And then, so uh, what's your outlook on 2025? It's, it's difficult for me to predict what they're going to say, but as far as we can tell from the information that we're gathering from inside the country, that they're going to be able to ramp production anywhere near what they've forecasted. So as of earlier this year, as of January, February, when they updated the market, when they said that they wouldn't be increasing production this year, barely at all. I think it was less than a thousand tons of, of expected increased production over last year. Uh, but they still have a 10% increase for 2025. Or excuse me, not a 10% increase, but 10% below their subsoil use contracts. Whereas right now, they are still operating at 20% at below subsoil use contracts, which they have been theoretically over the past five years or so. So... We, we don't see as of yet that there's been any plans on drastically increased CapEx. In fact, their expected CapEx increase uh, expenditures for 2024 was precisely in line with the increase in expected costs. So, so basically inflation, essentially. Um, so we didn't see on balance any, any net increase in money spent into the ground uh, or their plans for the year. So... Um, so that shows us that we're not going to see, unless we see quarter over quarter, this increase, which we could, you have to look at their every quarter reporting and see how much did they spend? How much was it compared to year over year and adjust for inflation and adjust for those, uh, tip, those increases on their, on their net costs. Right. So their, their operating costs were expected to rise by 26% and their CapEx was expected to rise by 26% off the top of my head when they put that out for the year back in February. So what does that mean? Well, with ISR mining, especially in Kazakhstan, you have to drill out the well field. You have to inject sulfuric acid and impregnate the deposit, and then you start to extract it. And so you have eight to 10 months after the well field is initially drilled to first production and about 12 to 18 months to peak production from that well field. So you look at the CapEx jump and then you say, okay, 12 to 18 months from now is when we'll see that increase in production. We're also not hearing that there has been any meaningful relief in the sulfuric acid market. It's still relatively tight and very expensive. That's a whole can of worms, but they're going to need more acid in order to increase production. Unless you're dealing with shallower, higher grade deposits going forward, you're going to have to have more acid in order to increase production. Just It's just basic physics of the way that these mines operate. So especially when you have declining production, you have high grading, you have assets basically that are in decline in terms of grade, that need, need, needs even more acid to maintain levels. Not all of their other projects are declining rapidly. And I don't mean to imply that, but barring getting into new deposits with higher shallower grades, you have to have more acid to increase your production. So we need to see a CapEx jump. We need to see evidence of some relief in the sulfuric acid market, their ability to import more from Russia, their ability to buy more from domestic sources. And importantly, their new facility that they are in the very, very early stages of building when that is operational. Now, they first expected that to be operational in 2026. We think that they're going to uh, now come out and say that's not going to be online until 2027. Uh, I believe that even that statement, if they say that, is going to be optimistic. But eventually, enough sulfuric acid and enough CapEx spent, they can increase production, but we believe that's easily three and probably four to five years away. And there's no evidence that we've seen that we're going to see increased production or meaningful increased production for 2025 over 2024. Now, they might tell the market that they still plan to increase. They might say that in August, but we haven't seen any evidence to suggest that that's going to be possible. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. Uh, so it seems like a lot of things are just like, uh, like this pressure just continues to, to 
to build and build and build and like it's just getting compacted in terms of like the um, the different factors for uh, higher uh, uranium prices. Um, so I was kind of wondering what is Sput up to? Is 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 Sput? What I haven't heard I haven't heard much in a while. Are they just stack, stacking cash or what? I haven't looked into it. Um, what what are they up to right now? They're up to just what they do, you know, on a on a normal everyday basis. There's nothing really new coming out of the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. They're holding their uranium. Uh, when they traded a premium to NAV, they can raise a little bit of cash. I don't think they raised any money in the month of June because they traded at a discount every single day that month. The discount has been fluctuating. It's gotten down to, you know, over the past few months, it's gotten down to a 14, 15% discount at the at the low end. And it's gotten very, very close to NAV. I think they raised a little bit of money in May off the top of my head. They've raised some cash this year. They bought a little bit of uranium this year, but they don't, there's not really much for them to do unless the market is risk on and they're trading at a premium. So for now they're holding their uranium. They've got small amount of expenditures, just their their management fees and, and things like that, but just to keep the lights on, but not a whole lot happening when they're at a discount. And I think as of yesterday, they were, they were at a 12 point something percent discount. They traded up a little bit today. Uh, the price of uranium dropped a little bit today as well. So uh, they're probably that discount shrank today. Anytime they get north of a 10% discount, anywhere 10 to 15% discount to now, usually that's a decent place to accumulate the trust. So that's what we look for. It's also a good sentiment signal. So when you see 12, 13% discount to NAV sentiment's pretty low. And it is pretty low right now. People are kind of scratching their heads. The market is dead quiet. What's going on here? Where's the nuclear renaissance? Why aren't the utilities buying, et cetera? The sentiment tends to be very, very low, especially during the summertime period. And I remember a few years back in 2021 when Sput just came on the scene, when they first had their ATM activated in August in the two months leading up to that sentiment was super low because it was like, okay, the market is expecting Sprott to come in and buy some uranium here. Why are these things trading so poorly? So short-term moves are very, very hard to predict and or justify. But to your point earlier, I think, I think it is a tradable market. It's just not the way we usually operate. I'm in California in the United States. I have to consider long and short-term capital gains taxes. I'm also very bullish for the long-term on this market. So I tend to not trade in and out of my positions very much at all. So usually I take low sentiment in pullbacks where we see daily RSI, you know, below 40 and especially below 30, like to accumulate in those ranges and kind of hang on for the long run. But if you are a trader, it is a tradable market. You see RSI extremely overbought. Sentiment is over frothy. You know, like we saw, you know, January, February, probably a time you could have taken some off the table and just kind of sat out the rest, uh, you know, a few months going forward during the quiet market. But we tend to be long term investors and try to accumulate when sentiment is low and RSI is low, hang on for the long term. And, and the market looks really, really good for the long term, you know, for the next few years in our estimation. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, so what what's your thoughts on um, uh URA versus uh, URNM. So, like when you're looking at, I'm just looking at the chart for URNM. Um, the high I think was was close to sixty bucks, sixty bucks a share um, recently, and sitting at forty seven. Uh, URA still seems to be um, lagging. I mean, it's at about twenty eight bucks. I think its high was um, a little uh, close to. 33 it didn't close above it but it touched it um what's your take on this or that yeah so urnm is 100 percent allocated to uranium names and ura is only 70 percent so ura has performed decently compared to urnm this year because of its other non-uranium holdings some of the utility stocks some of the large uh, large cap like multinational mining companies that ura holds have done well uh year to date but if you go back to the inception of urnm because it incepted basically uh just shortly let's see i think it was december 2019 so it was less than a year before the market really took off URNM has outperformed URA. So in a uranium bull market, URNM is going to have more torque. 
but there's nothing wrong. I mean, either vehicle is fine if you want general, very diversified, broad exposure to the sector. And uh, URA's liquidity is probably going to be a bit better. But for a smaller retail investor who doesn't want to buy a newsletter, or doesn't want to do the work on investigating individual companies, URNM is probably the way to go if you don't need uh, very, very high liquidity for large positioning. Gotcha, gotcha. And then, uh, I mean, URNJ, I mean, it's obviously junior junior miners uh, ETF. I mean, it was sitting at over 30 bucks a share and that's at about 23. Um, and any take on that? I mean, it seemed like that one probably has a lot of torque, like it can go up significantly if you're messing with the juniors, but then it can also uh, crater significantly or whatnot. Uh, <laughs> what's your take on U URNJ? Yeah, URNJ is very similar to URNM. There's, I believe, a lower threshold for entry, so it holds more small caps. It also doesn't hold a couple of the largest stocks. It doesn't hold Kazada, Palmer, Cameco, if I recall correctly. I think UEC and then Paladin are its largest holdings in next gen. So it's just even more torque, even more exposure to the smaller companies in the space. And it has underperformed. Let's see, I'm kind of charting in the background here. It's underperformed URA since inception now it incepted 18 months ago so it had it, it dipped in the first few months it had a tear going into february of this year and then it's pulled back on a relative basis to compare to ura so it's just added torque uh it's same thing it's kind of like ura less torque more liquidity urnm a little bit more torque a little bit less liquidity urj same less liquidity even more torque so uh it's it's kind of a retail darling it's grown a lot since its inception. I think it's only had one or two days of redemptions. It's mostly seen inflows and share issuance, um, which is a good sign. I really like you, RJ. Nice, nice. Um, I'm actually, I haven't looked at Paladin in a while. I'm actually um, very upset with myself. I didn't, uh, <laughs> I uh, I had I, I had held uh, Paladin uh, when it was at about 40 cents and uh, I, I didn't know it was sitting at, uh, 10 bucks right now um yeah that that's that's very disheartening i haven't looked at the chart for paladin in a while and so i recently heard the the news of um uh, paladin acquiring uh, fission and so uh, when you look at these these uh acquisitions mergers and acquisitions in in the uranium space uh what does this tell us about about the market um, it just tells you that the market is consolidating, that uh, the companies that have valuable paper are looking at utilizing that valuable paper. So we saw the same thing with Boss Energy taking a 30% stake in Encore Energy's Altamesa project recently. Um, we've seen UEC take out a couple of projects over the past couple of years. Uh, we're going to see more M&A. And M&A heating up like this is is a sign of of the bull market getting into its and getting into its gears so as the market matures and continues to progress we expect to see more m a but it's also just a very very small sector so you're not going to see as much m a as you would see in let's say a rip roaring gold and silver market where you have dozens of very large cap companies that are sitting on a lot of cash or very expensive paper uh, utilizing that paper or spending some of that cash and there's only a few companies actually even producing and creating cash flow. So most of the M&A that we've seen are companies that have been able to raise cash through ATMs like UEC or companies with very expensive paper trying to spend that paper like Boston Paladin. Now, Boston Paladin are two, are two were the only two uranium stocks up until recently that were held in the uh, ASX S&P 300 index. So it had a lot of, lot of torque and upward movement based on those passive flows there's been a few other companies that have been added to that i believe lotus bannerman and one other was it next gen i can't remember but either way those passive flows in that index have really moved it and of course you know when it pulls back it can pull back a little bit more than some of the others so we've seen a reversion to the mean with a paladin fission deal there's no guarantee this goes through i believe it still has to go to a shareholder vote i believe it has to get a two-thirds shareholder vote and now, based on the way that those two stocks have traded since that announcement, and honestly, within a couple of days of that announcement, Paladin trading down, Fission trading up, there's not really any premium baked into this deal any longer. Just maybe a few percentage points. I, I haven't done the calculations today. But 
um, you know, it's a good sign. It's a good sign to see that that the companies are are moving and shaking, and there's some more consolidation. And we expect to see more as the market progresses. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so, um, just transitioning uh, to, uh, I mean, just like my previous comments about uh, Paladin. Like, I had a lot of shares of Paladin. I jumped into another company, right? Sold Paladin. Paladin's at ten bucks. I had it at forty cents. Now, uh, I am sore about that, but I have gotten wins in, in other other areas. So like, you know, you, you, you're going to have your wins and losses. Sometimes you're going to uh, miss out on opportunities. You're not going to win every trade. Right. Um, but uh, I had a recently had a comment um, about um, a specific company in terms of uh, the uh, lack of price action movement. And um, I was kind of just wondering, you know, just in having a general uh, a general understanding, like some people are in companies that either ran up from the lows and they've just they haven't been very well performers uh, since then. And um, and then you have the companies that are like very, uh, very good performers like Paladin, uh, you know, Boss and, and a few others. And so um, how do you go about, you know, the picking and choosing in in this type of uh, sector. Uh, so uh, obviously, you know, one way is the Uranium Insider. I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, you know, people can get insight there, but um, how, how do you factor in, in these different companies and, and what they're doing? Obviously you gotta do your due diligence, um, but uh, it seems like, you know, some that you may see, that may seem like they're gonna be big winners, don't, don't really hit the lotto uh, like others. For sure. Um, this market thus far, I would say, with the exception of the moves that we saw at the beginning of the market, uh, of the bull market. So let's say December 2020 through November 21, uh, we saw the small and mid caps drastically outperform the, the large caps. And since then, as the sector has kind of consolidated that large move that took years, but the story has also progressed and we've seen more institutional interests, the large caps have outperformed the small caps, right? And that that is more typical of the early stages of a resource bull market. When the quote unquote smart money gets into a sector, they buy what's liquid and what's liquid is the large caps. And so we've seen an outperformance from Cameco, from NextGen, from Paladin, et cetera, et cetera. And the most liquid and the larger cap stocks have generally outperformed. And usually in a resource bull market, at some point we see a rotation when the market gets large enough and the mid caps start to look undervalued, relatively speaking, yet they have grown sufficiently to have enough liquidity for some of that money to rotate. Then you'll start to see the mid caps outperform. And eventually in the last two, three innings of a resource bull market, you'll see the small caps absolutely scream to the upside. We are, we are not in those stages yet. So that should give you some idea of kind of where we're at in this market. It takes a lot of patience. It's a very, very long-term bull market trade. And we are still in the general first stage, however many innings you want to say it we're in. Uh, you know, Larry McDonald from Bear Trap Support still thinks we're in maybe the second inning of a nuclear, nuclear renaissance you know, influenced uranium bull market. I still think we're in the first few innings. I thought we were in the first few innings four years ago. The story has changed. The story has progressed. When the story changes, when the information changes, my opinion changes. I'm not going to stick to the time frame I had in 2020 when so much has happened since then. So now we're actually seeing robust increases in electricity demand that's going to de-risk the fleets in a lot of countries. And it's likely going to influence rapid building of new nuclear power plants, potentially even in the West, which is not something anybody predicted a few years ago. So with all of that said, in previous bull markets, and it's hard to even compare this one to the bull market in 04 to 07, as it happened so fast and the dynamics were so much different. But around this price, inflation adjusted is when we started to see money rotate. So as the sector grows incrementally, as the months and years pass in this bull market, we're going to see some of that rotation. I honestly think 
there is enormous upside potential in the small and mid cap stocks because they have underperformed. They are cheap relative to the uranium commodity, even at these prices to speak generally. Some are cheaper than others, but I think there's a lot of potential. I don't think anything in the sector, these valuations is pricing in where the where we believe the uranium price is going to go. If you price in 80 bucks a pound, you can argue that maybe there's a few that are that are expensive or fairly valued at these prices. But if you price in where the sector needs to go and is likely to go relatively soon, we think there's uh, enormous value proposition here, especially in some of the small and mid cap stocks that that should and will be producing companies during this bull market. That's really where the sweet sauce is. You know, our process, we when we go through and look at companies, we look at share structure. I think it's really important to recognize where what are the outstanding warrants and options here for this company. How is that going to affect the movement of the stock? I can tell you that some of the companies that early on for our newsletter that we ended up not engaging with or not recommending and buying were due to the share structure. We like the story. In some cases, we like the management, but they had, you know, 50% of their outstanding share count was held in uh, outstanding warrants and options. And we knew that as the stock price progressed, that would be that would be a weight on the stock. And it was. Uh, one of those stocks, I'm not even going to say which one it is, has been an absolute disappearing act. It's gone nowhere for this entire bull market. And I'm glad that we didn't recommend it because of just the story. You have to look at you have to look at the numbers. So uh, the share structure is very important. Management's history, what they plan to do and would like to do with the company going forward. You also kind of have to believe in the story and not necessarily know what the company is going to do, but have a sense of what management might be able to pull off the bull market. And some of our biggest winners for the bull market so far have been stories that have developed during the bull market that were very difficult to foresee at the beginning. So we believed in management. We liked the share structure. We liked the story. We believed that eventually the management could get the project into development and into production. Maybe they had multiple projects. Maybe we believed that they would be aggressive into M&A. All of these factors can come into play. So jurisdiction matters, obviously project and deposits matter, management matters, share structure matters, and then a balance of all of those things. And then of course you have to consider your own, not you personally, but everybody as an investor, your, your investing goals, your age, your risk tolerance. Are you investing money that was handed down to you as an inheritance and you don't care about that much? Or are you investing hard earned savings? Like these things should influence how much you invest into a risky, volatile sector. So all of those things matter. You have to be diversified. Don't use leverage. Don't buy short-term options. Tranche into your positions. Have a rational allocation to the sector because it does move. It punches above its weight. When it moves, it moves hard. So you have to be able to stomach that volatility. And then, of course, you have to diversify. You don't want to just own uranium stocks. And for God's sake, you don't want to just own one uranium stock. I've known various people over the years that loved one particular stock or another and went all in on that stock. People think that they're Druckenmiller and they aren't. So uh, and nobody is. Nobody is Druckenmiller besides Druckenmiller. Okay? So diversify for the love of God. Protect your capital. And uh, yeah, it, it's important to choose stock. Stock picking is important. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, especially, you know, it, when you got people that fall in love with a stock. Like for me, I, I like, you know, companies. I've been able to meet some of the CEOs of some of the companies. And, and it's just like, you know, as an investor, I, I can't fall in love with the stock. I can't. I can't. You know, and um, and I, I think you, you mentioned quite a few good points. Uh uh, one is the patience. Like for me, um, I had sold out a Paladin back in like 2022. It was 2022. Um, and it was at about 50 cents, something like that. Um, I had been accumulated since 40 cents and I wasn't patient enough. I mean, even though I, I allocated that to, I, I don't know if it was next gen or something like that. And I still profited. But it's like just looking at the moves, the massive moves. It's like, oh, dang, if I would have been patient. And, and obviously that could have been luck. Like I didn't really study Paladin like that, you know, or whatnot. That could have been, you know, a lucky move, but that would have been a lucky break, you know. <laughs> but uh, but I think that um, that being patient is, is super important. And but it's also one of those things where 
if you're patient in a company that that isn't going to um, to move, like it, it can be detrimental. And so, I, um, you know, which that's why I appreciate the service you offer, because, you know, if if you're not into the the alpha trading to where you're getting into the weeds of of everything and, and you're more like, hey, I don't have time for that. You may want to go own a URNM or a URA, you know, versus um, and let the let the fund managers do that for you versus you trying to to pick those out yourself. For sure, yeah. There's there's nothing wrong with um, believing in the story and believing that you've got a long term investment on your hands and just wanting a, a simple diversified tool for exposure like URNM. Nothing wrong with doing that. Um, I prefer if usually if I'm bullish on something. And I want to go the ETF route. I usually go for options just to get some added torque to that. Because let's say I want copper exposure, but I don't have the time or the resources to investigate deeply into the copper market. Um, but perhaps like I personally subscribe to five or six different newsletters that cover various different sectors that I don't have the time or energy to look into. And oftentimes they'll make a suggestion. But even if they just make an overall broad take on where that market could be going, where they believe it's going, I can make a single pointed investment into that via an ETF usually versus um, either leaps or, you know, like vertical call spreads or something like that. That That's that's personally just me. If you want just, you know, less less torque and less risk, ETFs are, are a great way to go for sure. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Well, Justin, appreciate you for coming on, uh, dropping that game on us. Uh, everyone, be sure to go check out uraniuminsider.com. Also follow um, Uranium Insider on X. I will link to it in the descriptions. Uh, thank you for coming on. It's my pleasure. Always good to see you, Daryl.